a full prayer. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's go to God, our Lord, in prayer. Dear most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come before you this time. Thank you for blessing us with yet another opportunity to gather here at this place and spend time um, in worship and, and study another portion of your word. Lord, I pray that you be with us during this hour of worship. And may we do so in spirit and in truth. And may we glean something tonight that we need to hear and apply it to our lives and grow stronger in our faith and grow closer to you as your people. Lord, we pray that you be with Brother Mark that is to come up here shortly and as he presents another portion of your word to us, may he have a ready recollection of the things he studied. May he relay those things to us in a way that we can understand them and use them to our spiritual benefit. Lord, I pray that we are able to also use the things that we learn within this building and then during our personal Bible studies to draw closer to you, grow stronger in our faith, and grow stronger in our knowledge of your word, and, and in turn be able to bring more lost souls back to you and teaching your word to those we come in contact with on a regular basis. Lord, we thank you for this congregation that meets here at Liberty. Thank you for each soul that's represented here this evening. As we strive to work for you and, and serve your purpose here on this earth, we know that the Liberty's always had a, a heart to do so. And I pray that uh, the congregation here at Liberty never loses that. Lord, we thank you for every blessing that we enjoy in this life. We thank you for everything that, that we have. and. Pray that we always realize and remember that you are the source of every blessing we have. Lord, most of all, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. His perfect sacrifice for our sins. Pray that we never take his, um, his sacrifice and that blessing for granted. And it is in his precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus.
It's good to have each one back this evening. We've had a busy but a good Lord's Day um, with our Bible class and worship and then, um, of course, honoring Brother Jerry. And um, as he said, he hasn't left us yet, but we um, do appreciate him and um, hope to continue to see him for quite some time. But it's um, good to be back again this evening. We had a good fellowship meal as well, as Brother Pew mentioned. It's good to be back. You know, where is your focus right now? Have you ever talk to someone or maybe someone has tried to get your attention and you're so engrossed in a movie that you're watching and uh, that, that you're really not paying attention or maybe it's a book that you're reading or some project that you're working on you're just consumed trying to figure out how to finish your project or read the book or watch the movie and finally somebody shakes you and they said I've been trying to get your attention for the last five minutes and you realize you're kind of zoned out or in the zone on certain things or maybe you've had experience of, of trying to get someone else's attention a small child watching TV and you do this in front of their eyes and they never move. You know, it's just kind of glazed over. To be focused, where is your focus? You might say, well, it depends on. At times it might be on that movie. Other times it might be on that book or that project. At work, it's on the job that you're doing. You know, at home, it might be certain things going on in the home. It depends on the day. It depends on the need. But ultimately in life, while they have different little focuses here and there, where is your ultimate life focus? This morning we talked about uh, what is in your hand, but as we look at the things that we have in life, whether it's our talents, our abilities, our time, the life itself, where is your ultimate focus in life? In Hebrews chapter 11, we have that great hall of faith, men and women of great faith, who through faith in God, because they focus their attention on God and on the word of God, the plan of God, and faith in God, were able to accomplish great things. They look for the one you know, that had the city that had foundations, whose builder and maker is God, it says of Abraham. As you go into chapter 12, it looks to us now. You've looked at all these great people of faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we have all these examples set before us, we have a responsibility. Just like we said, what is in our hand? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance a race that is set before us. Well, how can we do it? How can we lay aside the weight of sin? How can we run with endurance a race set before us? He said it's by looking unto Jesus, having the right focus there. Why does that help? He is the author. He's the finisher of our faith, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He said, look, Jesus set the perfect example. He ran the race. He endured to the end. He was faithful. He didn't sin at all. He set the perfect example for us. He kept his eyes on the goal, kept his eyes on the mission. Mission. We look to Jesus in his example. As you maintain your focus on Jesus, we realize that Jesus never lost his focus. Jesus never lost his focus. Think about it. Before he even came to earth, while Jesus was still in heaven, in the glory of heaven, Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, here's the mind that he had, who being in the form of God, the eternal word, the second person of the Godhead, in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was focused on the mission at hand. He understood that if he came to earth, he's got to humble himself. If he came to earth, he's got to take on the form of a servant. If he came to earth, he is going to, to be in the likeness of man, and had to die a cruel death on the cross. But he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, a thing to be grasped, a thing to be held on to. He was willing to empty himself, to make himself of no reputation. He was willing to take on that bond servant. And we talked about that in the auditorium class this morning where Jude called himself a bond servant of Christ. You know, a person that puts himself, in the, in the case of Jude, in, into voluntary servitude to Jesus Christ. Jesus took it upon himself to, to, to come, you know, the, the God's plan for him to come to earth in the form of a bondservant, to come in the likeness of man, and he humbly obeyed even to the point of the cross. And so even before he came to earth, Jesus was focused. Before the foundation of the world, a plan was in mind. And then as the time grew near, Jesus was willing to come in the fullness of time to be born of the virgin. You move on to, at 12 years of age. He and his family, his earthly family, had gone to Jerusalem. They were on their way back home, and they realized when it came time to settle down for the night that Jesus was not in the company of all the people that were with him. He wasn't playing with the children. He wasn't anywhere to be found. They hurry back to Jerusalem. They find him 
Much time later, they're in the temple discussing um, the scripture with those religious leaders and amazing them at his knowledge of his wisdom as well. But in Luke 2 and verse 49, he asked Joseph and Mary, why do you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? He understood. He said, you know, I, I have my father's business. No, not a carpenter. That was his earthly parent, if you will, step parent. Uh, his true father is a heavenly father. The son of God is who he is. And when he talks about his father's business, he's talking about <coughs> heavenly business, God's business. And so at that point, he understands. He's focused. You can see it there when... Mary at that wedding feast wants Jesus to do something and he's talking about whether it's time to come or you know, it's time to not come. He's focused on the purpose. He's focused on, on the proper timing. You look at it as well during his ministry. In Luke 19 and verse 10, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He understood his purpose. It, it wasn't just to be popular. It wasn't to win a popularity contest. It was for a purpose to teach people, for a purpose to reach out in love to people and and he healed them, but also ultimately to offer himself on the cross of Calvary. He never lost sight of his purpose here on earth. And then when he set his sights to go to Jerusalem at the, at the proper time, he willingly went to the cross and, and died for us. He gave his life there on the cross. And really with his dying breath in John 19 and verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. I don't believe he's just saying there, it's finished, I'm, I'm about to die. I mean, he's not saying, oh boy, it's finished, my suffering is over. You ever been through something really painful and you think that it's um, about over and it's good? I, I remember some years ago, I'd had a tooth that had cracked because there wasn't room for it to come in. And I went to the dentist to get that tooth pulled. And um, I, he, go, he, he said, now you got crooked roots and all this. He's he, he setting me up for it, you know. And it, it was painful. It was frustrating for the dentist. He was up in my lap just about pulling. And when, when I, he goes, Mark, just hang in there. He goes, we're just about halfway finished. And that's about 30 minutes in. I'm going, I thought it was about finished. But well, when he was finished, I was thankful. But that's not what he's saying here. He's not just saying, oh, I'm thankful the pain and suffering is over. He's looking at it from the perspective of the work that he came to accomplish here on earth. His ministry, his mission, it is finished. He did everything he's supposed to do. He fulfilled every prophecy that he was supposed to have fulfilled up to that point. Everything was done. Every I, I dotted, every T was crossed. Every blank was filled in. It is finished. He had not lost sight. He had not lost focus on his, his purpose for being here, on his mission on earth. And then he could bow his head and give up his spirit. Jesus was focused. And so we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We look at Jesus and the focus that he had. What do we need to do? to maintain our focus on our mission. This morning we, we talked about using what is in our hand, whether it's our life in general, our eternal soul, the opportunities that we have, you know, the, the, um, the time that's given to us, the, the talents that are ours. To look at those from a spiritual perspective, to look at them from a godly perspective, to have the proper focus when it comes to those things. Because we can get so caught up in the here and now, we forget about eternity and forget about our mission. How can we as Jesus be focused on our purpose here? We didn't come to, to offer ourselves as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's been done for us once and for all time. But, we, but as Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And so how do we maintain our focus? Well, first of all, we need to serve in the name of Jesus. What is our purpose for being here? In, in the name of Jesus, by his authority, for his glory, we are to be servants. In Isaiah 6, God is asking, you know, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? You know, who's going to go out there? Who's going to, who's going to be willing to go out and, and spread the news that needs to be spread, to tell the, the, the message that needs to be shared? And, you, you know, you look at the messages of, of God's people in the Old Testament um, and New Testament as well. Sometimes there's, there's good tidings that come. You think about the angels that announce the, come, the birth of Jesus, and, and that's a wonderful announcement to be made. But so many times the announcements that come are not so good. You know, repent or perish is, is what's said on some of them. You know, there's condemnation on those who 
um, are not living, you know, that are not living right or doing right. You look at those letters to those seven churches in Asia Minor. I mean, there was one that was all positive, but the rest of them were not what they should be. I was, uh, somebody had put a little um, th thing saying, "Boy, if um, you know, if, if you look at uh, the Apostle Paul were here today, we'd be getting a letter from him. You know, most churches would. And, and that's something to think about: is what would God write about the congregation here? But if He's writing to me as an individual, what would He write through inspiration about me? And, and so the Lord's saying, look, who am I going to send? Who's going to go? And everybody kind of looks around and thinks, well, send him, send him. But Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. It's easier to wait for someone else to speak up. It's easier to wait for someone else to stand out. It's, it's easier to think someone has more talent than I do, as we mentioned today. But we have an opportunity given to us to serve. You know, God's always used people to reach people. I mean, there's times he gives his message directly, but so many times he sends a messenger. I mean, you can look through the scripture, and, and sometimes those messages may be positive, sometimes negative. As we mentioned this morning, again, Moses was sent to, to Egypt. God could have revealed it directly to him, and indirectly through Moses he did with the miracles and the plagues that he gave. But Moses, you go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. You have a mission there. You look at Jonah who was sent to the city of Nineveh and he had to be um, really pushed and shoved to get him to go there. You look at the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip was sent to teach. You, you look at Saul who Ananias went and not only healed him but told him, told him about his purpose and told him to rise and be baptized, wash away his sins, call in the name of the Lord. Cornelius who Peter was sent to talk to, talk to him. Example after example. God using people to reach people. That's the way God did it, through the foolishness of preaching, as it says. But he uses us. You know, we're an opportunity to, to make ourselves a part of God's providence. You know, God, we say God's providential care, God's providential work, not writing the message across the, the sky, across the heavens, not sending angels down to proclaim the news. But in you and me, we have an opportunity to take part in God's work, to serve others, to reach out to others, to, to do good for others. Look at your focus there. You know, we have an opportunity to let people see Jesus in us. And that ties us in with the next point as well, to share in the name of Jesus. I mean, we're serving. And there's ways to serve physically, but ultimately there are ways to serve spiritually. But we also share in the name of Jesus. We share with one another. We share with the world as well. In Acts chapter 4, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. It goes on talking about selling land and, and giving the money. It mentions um, Barnabas there as well and you know the encouragement, the encourager that he was, the encouragement that he gave. And, and they were just there was a commonness there. Everyone had their needs met. Not all their wants, maybe, but their needs met. People looking toward others. You know, I appreciate the love of this congregation, the unity that we have, and I pray that we'll keep that love and that unity and that we continue to, to encourage, to build up, to, to lift up one another, to help people when they need help, to encourage people when they need encouraging. We look beyond ourselves, and there's a world that, that needs help. A lot of people physically that need help. Many people spiritually that need help. You know, I appreciate the breakfast that we're doing, and there's other works we can do as well. But it, there's an ultimate goal, not just of helping people physically, but there's a, an opportunity to show Christ in our life because we're focusing on the mission. I appreciate those who, who serve by, by bringing food, preparing food, cleaning, setting up, cleaning up, for those as well that invite, for those that encourage others to come, for those that are here that sit down and, and talk to people and encourage them. And, and, you know, so far we haven't had, I don't think we have visitors that have come from the breakfast here, but I, I believe it, we will. But it's, it's still letting people see the love of this congregation and the concern that we have for others. You know, you look at the acts of kindness that we do. It can melt a person's heart and give one the opportunity to speak to them about Jesus. And that's what we're looking for. Not just doing good, but to do it in the name of the Lord. Not just reaching out and helping people physically, but leading to helping people spiritually as well because we maintain our focus. You know, how can I reach someone where they, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care, we say many times. And there's a lot of truth in that, isn't it? 
And so we serve in the name of Jesus. There's so many ways we can serve, big ways, little ways. But sometimes those kind words can mean a lot. That food prepared for someone can mean a lot. The, the sitting, coming by and visiting, sitting down and talking, just so many ways to serve, to help people, to reach out, to share with them. God has blessed us abundantly, and we have opportunity to share with those in need. And ultimately, it leads to us. If we want to have our focus right, whatever we're doing, in word or deed, we do all in the name of the Lord. Whatever we do, we do it through His authority, for His glory, because we want people to be saved. And so we save through the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, um, Philip had a great work going on in Samaria. A lot of people becoming Christians, yet you, you have a lot of different things going on there. Um, people rejoicing, great works being done. But then he's told, you go out there into that wilderness, to that barren area, and, and you're going to meet someone that needs you to talk to him. Going from a big work with a lot of folks to, to one person. God cares about the multitudes. He cares about the world, but he cares about the individual as well. Don't lose sight of the individuals in your life. I mean, we could look at that world that's lost and dying in sin, and sometimes we can overlook those that are nearest to us, those that are right around us, um, that need salvation or need help as well. And so he comes up, and he asked him, um, do you understand what you're reading? He goes, how can I unless someone should teach me? And Philip got up in the chariot, and they began there with the prophet that he was reading from, the prophecy, and it was a great place to talk to him about Jesus because that prophecy was about Jesus. And they began to focus. He preached Christ to him. And evidently, obviously, as he began to preach that, he talked to him about salvation because it wasn't just a, a scholarly discussion about who is this prophet talking about. Is he talking about Jesus? Is he talking about someone else? Is he talking about himself? But it's the purpose of why he was talking about. Who is the one he's talking about? Well, he's talking about Jesus. What was the purpose of Jesus? He was the suffering servant who would not only suffer but die on the cross for our sins, for the world's sins, for Philip's sins, for the eunuch's sins. And as they went along, the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? They got into how to become a Christian, you see. Everything was leading to that point. Sometimes we can talk about anything, everything. We can discuss any kind of religious matter, but sometimes it's easy to shy away from salvation issues. But isn't that what it's about? We have people that are lost, and we want to lead them to Christ. Um, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people focus on, you know, and, and I'm just talking about in the world or religious world in general, about we've got to show love, 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 and you really can't stand up for anything or stand against anything. You've got to accept anyone and everything. Yes, we have to have love, 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 but it's not loving to tell someone they're okay like they are if they're not okay like they are. You can remain in the sin that you're caught up in because it's all okay. No, it's not. You know, we can't continue in sin hoping that grace may abound. Now, we can do that in a spirit of love, but we lead them to it. And they got to the point of where the eunuch said, what's hindering me? And Philip said, well, you know, if you believe, you may. And he gave that good confession of faith. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Why did the eunuch rejoice? I'm sure he was happy to figure out what that scripture was talking about. Because, because sometimes, you know, you can be looking at something and trying to figure it out. And, and it just frustrates you. Uh, I had a math teacher that many times in school would just say, you know, confusion is the first step toward learning. And, I, and we'd always say, well, we're on our way to learning then because we're mighty confused. But, you know, and it's, it's fine to, to have questions, but you look for the answers. And I'm sure it was frustrating to him as he's trying to figure out, who's he talking about? Is it himself? He's looking for the clues there. And when he finally understood, he's talking about Jesus. And I'm sure he had heard a lot about Jesus when he was there in Jerusalem. That when he found out he's talking about Jesus, I'm sure he rejoiced and was happy to know, hey, he's the Messiah. He has come. He has died. He rose. He's reigning. But what really gave him joy was not just knowing the facts and having the answer there but it was because he was able to become a Christian. He was able to be buried with Christ. He saw the need, you know, what's keeping me from being baptized? If, if I need to be baptized, if I need to become a Christian, what's standing in the way? And he expressed his faith, and he was baptized. And that's what caused rejoicing, because he wasn't in his sins anymore. He had his sins forgiven. He was a child of God. He, you know, he was a disciple of Christ. He had salvation. 
And so he went on his way rejoicing. And a person, when they become a Christian, they truly understand what they're doing and, and truly become a Christian. They can go on their way rejoicing. It, it's a relief. It's a burden that's lifted. But if you're one that has taught someone, had some part in it, whether you're the one that actually baptizes the person or may, the person who had the final Bible study with them or maybe a person who's had some part to play in it, bringing them to church and bringing them to services or encouraging them in some way or you know, having different studies here and there with them or discussions and ultimately it leads to them becoming a Christian. Whatever part you play, doesn't it give you joy as well? Not because they look what I did, but look what happened to them. Look what the Lord did. Look at the difference in their life. Look at the salvation that's there. And knowing that you had a part in making an eternal difference in someone's life, that's a wonderful feeling, but it comes by maintaining our focus on our mission. Are we focused? Are we looking at Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, the one who kept his eye on the mission before him? Are we willing to serve? Not to serve our own needs, not to serve our own purpose, not to serve to bring glory to ourselves, but in the name of Jesus, to let others see our light shining so they can glorify our Father who's in heaven. Are we sharing with others? Sharing in love, sharing in care, not just with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do good to all men, but especially those of the household of faith. But there's all men as well. But ultimately, do we, have, we see our purpose. First of all, to make sure I'm going to heaven, to make sure I, I've got everything wiped out of my eye, that beam out of my eye, so that I can help wipe the speck out of someone else's. Do I realize I need to be a Christian so that I can encourage others to be a Christian? Why should they want to be a Christian if I don't see the need? Why should they be faithful if I'm not faithful? But to really focus on the mission at hand, to reach out and try to reach all the people that we can, to do what we can to bring others to Christ Jesus, maintaining our focus on the mission. You know, as we go about our daily lives, as you live your daily activities, again, there's a lot of different focuses we have in life. If you're working still, it's that job that you have to do. If you are at home with a family, it's that family that you're taking care of. You know, in certain recreational activities, we get caught up in those as well. So many different things, so many different areas. But as we go about those daily activities, be more conscious of our purpose. If I'm at home, how can I bring up my children and nurture and admonition of the Lord? If I'm at work, how can I, you know, really do the type of work I'm supposed to do and be the type of employee or employer that I'm supposed to be? How can I show others Christ living in me? In recreational activities or whatever, it, you know, activities we're involved in, am I picking activities that are right, that are, that are not inconsistent with being a Christian? And again, am I acting as I should in those? Because we see so many people that are not. It amazes me on some of these youth activities that we see, like whether it's you know base, youth baseball, youth football, or whatever. How many parents get caught up in hollering and yelling and screaming, and even into to fist fights, and and some into killing one another, all in the name of, of standing up for their child or standing against another, and just getting so upset. That shouldn't be our way. Again, we're looking at the purpose. We're looking at our focus day in and day out. The opportunities that are there to serve Christ. Don't lose focus. It's so easy to get distracted, isn't it? Someone does me wrong. So, something happens not the way I want, and I can lose my focus and become distracted and take my eyes off of Jesus. You look at Peter when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink on the storm's tall sea. Don't lose your focus. Don't get distracted. Don't let it cause you to act in a way you shouldn't act or to say or do things you shouldn't say or do. But instead, we need to serve. We need to share. We need to do what we can to have our part in saving the lost. Ultimately, it's the grace of God, it's the blood of Christ that cleanses them, of course. But we seek, we, say, we seek to save the lost as well in the name of Jesus. Where is your focus? Tonight, if you're not a Christian, where is your focus? You can be on many things, but right now, you should be like the Ethiopian eunuch says, what hinders me from being baptized? And whatever it is needs to be put to the side, and you need to obey the Lord and become a child of God tonight. As a Christian, what's got you distracted? What will it take to make that focus be what it should be? If you need to respond in any way to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.
you would like to be served the Lord's Supper this evening, please raise your hand and you'll be served. Is there anyone that would like to contribute to the Lord's work? 